I wanted to talk this evening about this idea of taking God personally, which I think you made me feel God very personally there, Tina. Some of you uh, may have taken the uh, class with Dr. Mark a few months back, The Four Agreements, based on the book by that title by Don Miguel Ruiz. And one of those agreements that supports us in awakening to our spiritual nature is to not take things personally. And you know that's very consistent with what we teach in Science of Mind, because we emphasize that nothing in the world defines us, that God's nature of all goodness, all lovingness, all compassion, all intelligence and creativity, that that's in us and it's greater than any past or any present condition or circumstance in our lives or in the world. When we take things personally and when we're, we're talking about that, we're usually referring to when we feel hurt, wounded, offended by something or by someone, which I don't know about you, but I would venture to guess that I'm probably pretty safe in saying most of us have a tendency to do that from time to time. What we're doing is we're identifying with a worldly condition, a worldly situation. In some way, we're believing that it has power over us. And subconsciously, I mean, we're not intentionally doing this, but subconsciously, we're denying our divine nature that can make good of everything. So, you know, if we knew that, we wouldn't take offense. We would just look at what good we can make out of something. So not taking things personally doesn't mean that we deny any of the negative circumstances or conditions. It doesn't mean that we're totally okay with people who might be uh, mistreating us or uh, don't have our greatest uh, intentions in mind, but it's that we have a strong sense of a presence in us all that we can call forth as goodness to make good of whatever is going on. For example, there's a vibration of abundance and generosity and givingness in all of us that we can align with, that it's in us, but it's infinitely greater than any of us. And we can align with it and allow it to flow. And that can heal any of the conditions of lack that we might be experiencing humanly. There's a capacity for us to love and be compassionate for one another that can heal any circumstances of discord in our lives or in the world. And when we deeply sense that, when we have a deep, deep sense of that truth, we're less likely to focus on the negative conditions and instead to open up to the potential to heal them. And that's what we're, that's what we're aiming for. So the antidote to our tendencies to take things in the world, situations in the world, personally, is to feel a personal connection with a goodness that is greater than anything in the world that transcends this world, and yet that resides in us and that we're, we're one with. Sensing God's nature as being what's most true, most real about us is what I'm referring to when I'm talking about taking God personally, feeling that personal connection with the divine. You know, and one of the aspects of Science of Mind teachings that I think many appreciate when they you know, are first introduced to this philosophy and to any new thought philosophy is that we don't subscribe to the idea of a God as an entity outside of us that has some very, very human characteristics. You know, there are many that I think have had negative experiences 
from being in traditions that promote this idea of a very human, capricious God that favors some and you know that seems to not appreciate others as much. And that God is often feared, yet somehow is also supposedly unconditionally loving, which, you know, I was raised hearing about that idea of God, and I always found it interesting that, you know, God was supposed to be unconditionally loving as long as we met certain conditions. Okay, but <laughs> that said, I think a lot of us um, moved away from that idea, and you know, we we appreciated finding a tradition that didn't have that idea of God. You know, we don't teach that any suffering in the world or any negative conditions are because God got angry and imposed them on us. We emphasize that the negative conditions in our lives and in the world come out of are fear-based thoughts that lead to feelings and beliefs in lack and limitation in me versus you, in my good versus your good, and you can, I can't, et cetera, et cetera, that lead to negative feelings, negative behaviors, negative circumstances. It's not because there's any being out there that's wishing that upon that. So we emphasize that there's this law of cause and effect that responds to our thoughts, that responds to our beliefs to create the negative circumstances or the positive ones when we have positive ways of seeing things. So if we look at that, and that is an aspect of our teaching that we emphasize a lot, is that there's this law of God, this law of cause and effect, and we emphasize that it's really impersonal. You know, it, it just operates, it responds to our thoughts. It doesn't judge them, it just responds. Kind of like the law of gravity on the physical plane. You know, you let go of something, it falls to the ground. Ernest Holmes, our founder, talked about the law as something that responds mechanically to our thoughts and produces corresponding circumstances. The good news about that is that when we don't like the conditions, when we don't like the situations that we're experiencing, we can change our thoughts, we can change our whole belief system into more life-affirming beliefs that then produce positive experiences. We are not you know, judged by the law, like, well, you've had this many negative thoughts, so you are just going to experience negativity from now on, any more than gravity says, well, you've just dropped five objects, so from now on, you're just going to drop things the whole time you go through life. It's like, once you learn that that's why that fell, you don't do that, or you try <laughs> not to do that anymore. And so it is with this law of cause and effect. And it's empowering and freeing as that is from the old ideas of a capricious God, um, it can also be something that can hold us back from cultivating that sense of oneness with God. You know, this idea of the law being impersonal, when it's emphasized, if we put a lot of focus on that aspect of spirituality, how, how warm and fuzzy does impersonal feel to you? I don't know. I'm not getting this really warm vibration in my heart as I'm talking about it. You know, Ernest Holmes um, said toward the end of his life that he wished he had emphasized the idea of God as pure love versus this law of God. But the thing is, you know, we can all look back in retrospect but the truth is, if he had, it would have been hard for people to accept because you have to first understand that the reason there are negative circumstances in the world is because of our negative beliefs and the law acting on those so that you're not buying into the idea of a sometimes unloving God. So that needed to be emphasized, but you know, once once we get that concept, once we understand it, if we focus too much 
on the law of cause and effect as you know, an aspect of God's nature, it doesn't, in my way of thinking, really uh, inspire us to try to cultivate a connection, a relationship. I mean, how much do you want to cultivate a relationship with something that is mechanical and regular? Holmes tells us that God is personal to all those who feel this indwelling presence. That's encouraging us to cultivate a personal connection with the divine. And so in this teaching, while we recognize that no human image or idea of God can encompass the infinite nature of God, you can't put any finite image of God and say that's the infinite, it doesn't mean that we can't use images or ideas, human symbols of God to help us open to something bigger. You know, I really appreciate in the Hindu tradition, there are so many different deities, Hindu deities, but the Hindu philosophy is very clear that there are not multiple gods. There's only one God. These are just different facets of God's nature that people can focus on to relate to. Having been raised in Catholicism, I personally always loved the icons that we had in Catholicism, the icons of the Virgin Mary, of Joseph, of Jesus, of the saints that you had these human images, often statues or paintings in churches, so you could see an image that I was very aware as a child that I felt that these were things that I could relate to that opened me up to something bigger. You know, we're not saying that that statue or that image has any power, but if it's a symbol that you can relate to that gives you a sense of a motherly love and opening up to a vibration of that. If it's a symbol of power or strength that opens your heart and your mind up to that power and strength of the divine that you are connected with, these are all things that help you to, um, to see yourself as part of something bigger but wonderful and to open to that presence, to allow it to have a greater expression of itself in your life. When I was in India a few years back, I learned that it's actually quite common for people there to have an image of the divine. It might be one of the saints, one of the deities, um, could be some other image that they picked up along the way, but that that's an image of God that they can relate to, and they will converse with this image. It becomes a presence that they can relate to as a presence that's benevolent, that's wise, that, again, it's not that they believe that that image has any power of its own, but it's something that the human mind can relate to, to open to the infinite. And, you know, when, um, when I've played with that idea over the years, I've worked with there have been many images that have come to me in meditation or at other times that have helped me to open up to that presence of God. I know I've shared before of how some thoughts or remembrance of my grandmother in different situations, my grandmother in France, opened me up to that feeling of her being a channel of a vibration of just such compassion and love and having felt that from my mom. I will sometimes think of my mom and then feel that vibration and realize she was a channel of this, you know, vibration of love that's just so big that it allows me to open my heart and move into that space, that expansive space. I remember at the Self-Realization Fellowship Garden in um, the Pacific Palisades, one day I was there, and at one point I was just watching a turtle that was hanging out on a rock. And I became transfixed, and I felt like the energy of that creature just basking in the sun, just being. 
And all of a sudden, I was transported to this place. I, I had no idea how long I was there, just being in that energy of being. Years back, I remember Jean Houston. She had just um, finished a book, her book, Mystical Dogs. And I heard her speak about one of the stories that she uh, shares in her book about how she had one dog that she really believed wanted to learn to speak. And she said, and when this dog tried to speak, the way it would do so is it would lie on its back and it would like shake its legs and its head would go back and forth. It would try to make these sounds. And so she said, I know this dog is trying to speak, so I'm going to teach it to say my name. And so she would say, say Jean. And the dog would go like, and she would go, say Jean. And the dog would go, Gee. and all of a sudden one day she was looking at the dog and she goes, oh my gosh, when I am like just so struggling to have a better experience of life and all that, that's how I must look to God. <laughs> Not long ago, I was so frustrated with myself in that I was going through something where I was really just trying to put something behind me, just forgive someone for you know something they did unconsciously, and yet I, it just kept coming up. And I know my spiritual practice. I've moved through the process of forgiveness before. I was getting so frustrated. And as I was working on it one day, I had that image that Jean Houston shared with us. And I saw myself, and I felt the presence of this being that was just going like, aw, <laughs> you're so cute. <laughs> that frustration just melted. And the sense of having to try to forgive, I just went like, oh, this whole thing is so silly. It just all went away. It was an image that opened me up to that vibration of the divine. And, you know, I've heard people talk about having just felt the divine as a benevolent presence holding them. I've heard people talk about its pillars of light. I remember a woman sharing one time that she would, when she was going through a really difficult time in her life and needed a sense of strength and power, she would sit and close her eyes and remember this time when she was on a mountaintop uh, after a hike that she had done and this majestic view that she had and she would call forth that image and then sing, how great thou art. And just tears would fall down her face when she would do it, but it gave her a feeling of that strength and that majesty of spirit. So all this <laughs> to offer the idea that if there are times that this idea of connecting to God feels more like just a theory, I'm one with God, I'm one with a great presence, and you're not really feeling a connection from the heart, it's not conjuring up the feelings of that vibration of spirit, think of an image that inspires you, a, a being. It could be a human or otherwise. Some presence, some image or vibration that you can call forth as a presence that just loves you unconditionally, is always there encouraging you. I think if we do that and focus on that feeling and remind ourselves that this represents just a fraction, just a fraction of the love, the power, the beauty, the abundance of God, and that we're connected to that, if we do that, we activate those aspects of the divine in ourselves so that we can experience them more fully and as we experience them more fully, we're able to share them more expansively. So I'm going to invite you to turn your attention inward and call to mind any aspect of God's nature that you'd like to experience and express more fully. Be it peace, joy, love, abundance. Just pick one. and call to mind any image of a being 
or something that represents that quality of God. Just imagine this is a presence that is there to help you experience this aspect of its nature for yourself. Sense this imagined being or light or whatever images come to mind as absolutely delighting in sharing this quality of God with you. And as you do this, recognize how this is awakening you to the vibration of that quality of God in you and opening you to experiencing it more expansively. Allow yourself to realize that this presence is part of you, but ever greater than you, and always available for you to open to for greater experiences and expressions of good. And allow yourself to rest in the sense that this presence is always there in you, around you, in and around all beings, ever available as every form of goodness to be experienced and expressed. And it's from this place of feeling that presence of the divine that is the one power and one life animating all life that I invite you to join me as we know that that life lives through all beings, all situations, everywhere. And so let us know that wherever there is any experience of discomfort with change, that that nature of the divine is there as a constant, unchangeable presence of good. It is that vibration of eternal life eternal love in which we are always connected in this lifetime and beyond, that we can never be separate from it. And so, as we know this truth, these, these feelings of discomfort melt and new ideas, new ways of experience that nature are revealed. Let us absolutely know that this presence is a presence of health, and wholeness, and so where there is any experience of dis-ease or discord, we know that in God is all healing, in God all the solutions to every problem, all the cures to any ailments are already known, and as we absolutely embrace that, we call forth that energy to reveal all the pathways of healing for everyone to have that greater experience of wholeness and well-being. Let us know that this creative presence is always moving through us as an energy of giving of itself unto itself so that if there's any sense anywhere of being out of alignment, of not being valued or appreciated, not, not knowing where to give one's gifts, that the divine knows how and what to give uniquely and creatively through each of us, bringing all to their perfect right place of expression and being valued and fulfilled. We remember right here, right now, that this presence is infinite, that it knows nothing of lack and limitation. And as we know that, as we open to that vibration of absolute abundance, just a constant pouring in and generously sharing, giving back, that we see an absolute dissolving of experiences of lack and limitation and a greater emergence of experiences of abundance, of greater giving and receiving. And we absolutely recognize that presence as a vibration of love, a love that we call forth right here, right now, that is greater than any of the sense of our differences, ways that we cannot love ourselves or love others, 
It is greater than that. It is a presence that is so unconditionally loving and we open to it and see our hearts open so that we can feel that love and share it more expansively. And we know that that love is always an energy for greater good. And so let us honor it as we open ourselves up by setting our intentions for greater good in silence. So whatever these intentions may be, let us recognize them as the vibration of God seeking that greater knowingness and realization of itself in all parts of creation. And as we know that God is in all these situations, good is revealed. And together we declare, I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And so we bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full and grateful heart, just knowing that God is in all, all places, all situations, I release this word knowing it is so. I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen.